Sports cards and we live now. Jeremy Lee in the building and every guest that you ever needed. Sports cards after hours keep the hobby heated. Updates, hobby talk like you've never seen it. Sports cards live and none could ever beat it. Sports cards is a lifestyle. Sports cards and we live now. Welcome to another episode of Sports Cards Live with your host, Jeremy Lee. All right, everybody, welcome to episode number 165 of Sports Cards Live. It is Saturday night, December the 17th, 2022. My name is Jeremy Lee. I would like to thank Catherine Harrison from Magpie for joining us last week. You can see that episode and all other episodes of Sports Cards Live on the YouTube channel. Also, let everybody know this coming Tuesday, December the 20th, we have a double header on the channel, 7 o'clock Eastern, Collectible Live with Ezra Levine from Collectible. And then at 10 p.m. Eastern, we have Lane Pierce. He is the founder of 130 Point. He will be joining Sports Cards Live on Tuesday. Those episodes will wrap up the show for the year. We'll be back in the new year. I'd like to ask you to join the close to one quarter million people who have already downloaded the Center Stage app across both iOS and Android for quick comps, whether you are at a card show to help you price your cards, or if you are just shopping yourself and check out their collections and albums features too. The app is continuously improving, so please join me in supporting the great team they have there and the innovation that they are undertaking at Center Stage. You can see the app and how to follow them on the ticker right now. Want to welcome back Whatnot to the channel as a sponsor. Check out the Whatnot app for auctions, group breaks, buy it now. It's hosted around the clock by some of the most entertaining breakers in the hobby. And also shout out Leighton Sheldon, Just Collect. Leighton will be joining us shortly tonight for the Vintage Update segment. And I'd also like to thank the following fellow content creators for inviting me onto their shows over the last week. First of all, Dustin and Brad from Off Centered having me on on Wednesday. Had a lot of fun there. Good group of people were on that show. And also Danny Black and his Sports Balt podcast, which dropped last Monday. Thanks to all of those guys. Lastly, let everybody know I will be doing an after hours episode late tonight, 12 o'clock Eastern, showcasing my top 22 pickups of 2022. Thank you again. And as always, to all of our loyal viewers and listeners, if you are not yet subscribed to the channel, please take a moment and do so. And as always, your comments, your questions are in play. So let's get to it and get to tonight's guest. He got started in the hobby collecting Pokemon cards when he was five years old growing up in China. He forgot about cards until about 2018 when he discovered the hobby again via a Gary V post on LinkedIn. He launched his company Veriswap in 2021. His favorite team is the Los Angeles Lakers. Favorite athlete is Kobe Bryant, rest in peace. Originally from Birmingham, Alabama, currently hailing from Sydney, Australia. Let's bring him out. Raymond Lee, welcome to Sports Cards Live. How are you doing tonight? What what time is it where you are? 2 p.m. Sunday afternoon. (laughs) So it's actually tomorrow for you. Here we are Saturday night and you had your Saturday night already. That's So you're in Sydney, Australia. Yeah, um, I've been here for the past three months. I've always wanted to move here and uh, here I am. And how do you how do you like I I was there in in 1990 91 I loved it there how is it so far being that you're uh you know you you've lived in a few different places we'll get to that but how are things in Sydney Australia right now amazing uh yeah. it was I came to visit in 2019 I was actually going to move there in 2019 uh, obviously didn't have the chance to um, and it's you know the past three months here have surpassed my expectations like every day you know I walk outside I see something new learn something new um, it's it's amazing. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful place for sure. I, I'd love to get back there sometime. So I mentioned just now in the intro that you're originally from Birmingham, Alabama. Why don't you just let us know, where have you, where did you grow up? Did you grow up in China, Alabama, California? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, people are oftentimes surprised when they uh, hear that I was born in Birmingham. Uh, my parents went to school there. Um, and then shortly after, uh, when I was two, I moved to Chicago uh, because of my dad's job. Uh, and then after that, we moved to Shanghai for eight years. So from uh, kindergarten to seventh grade, uh, lived in Shanghai, uh, went to, you know, an English speaking American school. So like all the teachers, uh, they spoke, uh, they taught in English. Um, and then after that, uh, moved to California, uh, Northern California. So like near San Francisco. Um, and then after that moved to Manhattan for college, uh, was there for about eight years or so. Um, and then, uh, now, now I'm here. 
So, so yeah, a little bit everywhere. <laughs> yeah, you've been in a, you've lived in a few places for sure, which is which is really awesome just for life experience. But let's let's get into your hobby history now. You know, I mentioned that you started off uh, as a kid collecting Pokemon. You kind of forgot or just weren't in touch with the hobby for several several years. You you were kind of reminded of it by seeing a post by Gary V on LinkedIn. Um, and Gary V is a, he's a polarizing figure in the hobby. Speak a little bit to what that post was and what it kind of did to how did it get you back in? Yeah. Uh, so I was, so back in 2018, um, I was working um, at a finance job. I absolutely hated it. I was working like 80 hours a week, um, basically like on PowerPoints and Excel files. Um, I hated it. Uh, so I quit with like no job lined up. And then one day, um, you know, I was eating lunch um, at home and I was on my phone and I saw this LinkedIn article um, that, Gary Vee had posted. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have seen this, but it's basically the article that uh, pitched the FLIR Jordan PSA 9, this FLIR sticker Jordan PSA 9, um, and the Giannis Prism PSA 10 is like, you know, these are the best investments. Uh, back then, the PSA 10 Jordan was around 30K. You know, now it's much more. Uh, the Giannis card was probably in the range of like $400. You know, now it's also much more. Um, I always been like invest interested in investing in stocks, um, but I thought that, uh, sports cards is like really, really interesting. So I joined a Facebook group, um, and just started like browsing at first, um, uh, looking at, I thought I was like, oh, these cards are like actually like very aesthetically pleasing. Um, I remember the first card that was very memorable that I really wanted, um, was the Jordan titanium. It's the horizontal card, um, that had like the light blue and like the, you know, the piercing red Jersey. Um, I remember like talking with my friend Kelly from Montana. We're still friends to this day um, about that card. Um, and yeah, like from then on, like one thing led to another, went to the national that July and yeah, like four years later here, here I am. Didn't think I'd end up in Australia, but. <laughs> and does, does you being in Australia have anything to do with the hobby or is that just where you wanted to live and you can run your business and be a hobbyist from there as well? Exactly. Um, Nothing to do with cards. I've always just wanted to live here. Cool. Well, here we have uh, we have a few comments coming in already. I'm going to start with this one that just came in from, I'm guessing this is Corey from Show Your Slabs and welcome to the show. Corey says, what's your first take on the hobby pretense in Australia? I seem to know a bunch of collectors that either live in or are from Australia. So yeah, if you, uh, just your his first part of the question there. What's your first take on the hobby there? Yeah, so um, sports wise, it's mainly basketball. Um, and soccer. Um, people don't really collect baseball and American football. Um, I've actually met up with a few collectors um, in Sydney, um, and they tend to be, you know, what you describe as like, you know, older, uh, more traditional collectors. Uh, you know, they collect like 90s inserts, like Jordans, obviously like Jordan is really popular here. Uh, but I would say like, just given like the, uh, like geographic uh, separatedness from like the rest of the world, um, you know, there's probably like less, less prospecting. Like people don't really buy like, you know, Kobe white. Right. Um, just because it's like so far from the rest of the world. So they're more or less attracted to the, the goat type players, the, the, the Kobe's, the Jordans, the LeBron's, that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah makes sense. You mentioned that, uh, you know, you were investing in some stocks and, you know, then you, you kind of discover the hobby again with your own collecting sports cards. Do you look at collecting sports cards as collecting them or investing in them or some sort of hybrid of the two? Um, I used to focus more on the, I would say the flipping aspect. So not really the investing aspect, but, you know, I'd buy a bunch of raw cards in like 2019 and then grade them and then sell them on eBay. Uh, but I would say now, like I purely just collect, um, you know, I buy the cards that I like, the ones that I think are like really, really cool. Um, and you know, in terms of like investing, like I'd rather invest in uh, my own business Veriswap um, because it comes with like, in my opinion, like more of a component of learning uh, versus like, you know, buying a card where it's like, okay, I have this card in front of me, but um, I'm not really learning in the process of holding that card. Oh, that's an interesting take. I've never really heard that take before, but I guess it, it somewhat does make sense that, uh, you know, there are some things you could learn about the card if you're interested in, you know, researching the set it came from and the uh, you know, any sort of um, lineage it has to older sets or, you know, the pattern, that kind of thing. 
but as far as really studying and, and educating yourself in a uh, some some body of, of, of knowledge, there's you know the, the hobby's the hobby, and then, and then there's and then there's real education and all that out there too. So I kind of understand uh, what you're saying there. You're also involved in some Facebook groups as the administrator. Do you want to sort of shout out what Facebook groups there those are? Yeah. Um, so um, I'm admin in a few Facebook groups. Um, NBA Hotspot, which is exclusively basketball. Uh, we have about 32,000 members. Uh, Bowman Chrome High Roller, uh, which is a mix of all sports. It's around 12K members. Um, cards Buy, Sell, Trade. Um, that's around 30,000 members. Um, and then the Asian Cards Group, which is like you know my group that I started from the ground up. Um, that has around 3,000. Wow, so that's that's quite a few members. That that's really cool. And are you are you active in these groups, kind of just talking hobby and uh, that sort of thing? Are 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 some like you mentioned the the buy sell? So I can understand what that is. But the I think you mentioned Hotspot has about thirty thousand members. NBA Hotspot, and I I think I'm I think I'm a member of that group, or I was a while ago. Uh, what is that group all about? Yeah, so that group um, is all about basically NBA basketball. Uh, it's cards only, so like no no memorabilia. Um, so like the focus of the group is actually like very tight, um, which is, I, I guess why, why I like it, um, in terms of like buying and selling cards on that group, like I haven't bought or sold a card on that group, like for, for a while, uh, to be honest, like I mainly use that to like promote my own content. Uh, there's a lot of posts on that group uh, about Veriswap. Um, so that's kind of like the main, you know, I kind of take a hands-off approach. Got it. Okay. Let's say hello to Perk. What's going on? Good evening, Perk. Mod Cult in the house. Chris C says, looking forward to hearing about trading safely online. Trading online seems impossible without a third party. And we'll find out what Veriswap does and how it uh, acts as that third party. Chris C says, good taste in teams. Kobe and a Laker fan like me. Very nice. Mosaic Mind. Now, I don't know what this is about, but he says, Roll Tide or, or War Eagle. Do you know what that's all about? Because I don't. No. <laughs> no, let's keep on going. And Justin Vick says, Kobe, Jordan's LeBron's, maybe some Luke Longley's, because Luke Longley was an Australian player who, uh, well, still an Australian player who played in the NBA. That's a nice one, Justin Vick. Good call out uh, right there. So let's talk a bit about Veriswap now, because I always like to, you know, there's a lot of people starting companies in our hobby, and it's interesting to see, really, I, I always, am, one of the things that I'm most curious by is, what was the aha moment when you realized there was a need for a service like Veriswap? And with that, and I guess it's a two-part question, I tend to do that is, did you have to pivot at all yet? But let's just start with, you know, actually, we'll start with this, Raymond. What was Veriswap originally? Because I, I happen to have some inside information that it has pivoted a bit. So what was Veriswap originally? And what was your sort of aha moment for the original plan? Yeah, so I'll start with the aha moment and then start with the plan. So basically, uh, my background um, in the hobby was that in early 2021, um, I would buy, sell, and trade cards on Instagram. Uh, you know, I would do the thing where I, you know, buy cards off of people's Instagram feeds, buy cards off, cards off of people's auction houses, uh, and then trade them uh, via via Instagram. Um, one choke point um, was that trading was very difficult because even if both sides agreed to a deal. Um, there was that uh, element of trust, right? Um, I mainly dealt with like very, very high-end cards. Um, but sometimes, you know, uh, no matter, you know, like what, how trustworthy the other person is, um, it's difficult to kind of uh, trust them if you haven't like met them face-to-face -face before, right? Um, so the way people typically got around that was by gathering vouchers. You know, we'd, you know, talk to like a mutual friend, someone who'd like done a transaction with, um, and then, you know, uh, help with that. Uh, vouch gathering was like a very time intensive process. Um, it also like was very messy in case something went wrong. You know, there's kind of like that back and forth of like, okay, like who's actually responsible, right? The person giving the vouch, the person who um, actually scammed, right? Um, if something gets lost in the mail, what happens, right? Um, so that was kind of like the initial uh, impetus for creating what we call Verisot V1, which was essentially a vouches database. Um, you could create an account on our website, um, upload personal information about yourself, um, as well as um, a list of vouchers of people um, that um, had, you know, that you had transacted with before. So for example, like Jeremy, you know, if I had done a deal with you before, I would put your name down as a vouch, 
Ferris Hop would go in and manually verify that vouch be like, okay, you know, Raymond, put your name down as a vouch. Do you agree to this vouch, right? Um, so that was V1. Um, found out that people, we had a lot of signups, but people ultimately weren't willing to pay for it uh, because we didn't offer like some sort of insurance or guarantee, right? We were basically just like an information database. Um, so then we decided to pivot um, around mid 2022 uh, into our current form. Okay. And so what was, what, how did that work for you, the, the pivot and, and just what is the current form, if you will? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it open-ended like that. Yeah. Uh, so the current form uh, is basically um, a marketplace where you can upload your inventory um, to our website and drag and drop and trade with any user around the world. Um, so say, for example, you know, say I upload these two cards um, to uh, my Verisop account. Um, I, someone is interested, uh, they can offer card for card um, to uh, exchange for my cards um, in addition to cash on either side. Um, and then once both users agree to a transaction, uh, they ship the cards to the Verisop headquarters, uh, fully insured. We cover the insurance. Uh, we make sure that, you know, the slabs uh, look good, um, that the packages contain what they say they contain. And then we execute the final leg of the transaction. By shipping the cards to their ultimate destination. Exactly. So in essence, we're essentially a technology platform that links different traders. Um, and then also a mailman service that makes sure that uh, you get your cards at the end of the day. And a bit of an escrow service as well. Not You're not taking a fee on value, I don't think, but an escrow service in that if I if I don't want to send my card to the person I'm trading with because I don't know them, I met them on whichever social media platform, I send them to you, they send their end to you, you verify you've received both ends as they were supposed to be, and then you ship them out to their ultimate destination. And that's the, that's the service that you provide, which is really... You, you're not going to send something out and not get something back. But if you do, you're at least going to get your original cards back. Is that right? Correct. That's cool. And just so everybody knows, uh, Raymond did send me a video that actually is like a tutorial on how to use the service. I'll, I'll put a link to that in the show notes and in the description on YouTube uh, when we're done here. So if anybody wants to go back and watch that to see really how it works, because I've checked out the, I've checked out, Raymond, your platform, and it is very, very slick. I have to say, it's uh, I, I, I really think it's cool. You guys, your development team did a great job building out that website, and I'd encourage people to go and check it out and see if it's something that uh, that you want to use. I think it's pretty cool. Before we get more into Veriswap and sort of um, just more of the details of it, because there's a lot there, and I think it's pretty cool, uh, we're going to bring out Leighton Sheldon, who's going to come and join us for the vintage update segment, something we've been doing for about about a month and a half now, I think. And uh, Leighton always brings a, a vintage sort of topic to the table, and uh, we get to chat with him a little bit. So let's bring Leighton out and see what he has for today, and uh, I'll introduce it to you. So Leighton, welcome back as always. I want If you don't know Raymond, Raymond, this is Leighton. Leighton, this is Raymond. Hey, Raymond. How, how you good? Hello. Long time no see. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations on uh, the success of Veriswap. You know, um, uh, all I was thinking, and I know a little bit about it, Rainy, because we had talked offline, you know, before you kind of went live with everything. And I'm going to spend some time, probably tomorrow, because I have my son this evening, uh, to kind of check out the new version of it. But I don't know why this is stuck in my head, but, like, I love the vouching and, like, all this verification. And if it's already taken, so be it. This is kind of a funny thing. It came to, you know, the top of my mind. But like, what about mob swap, right? Like everyone's made. If you're a made man, right? If you're if you're made, if you're if you're vouched for, then basically like you're okay to trade with. So yeah. that way, you know, you can uh, basically uh, have a little bit more fun with it. But I, I really do like what you're doing, Raymond. And I'm gonna be sure to check it out because, um, you know, lots of times, and I know Raymond, some of the stuff that you've dealt with in the past, meaning like let's say lower pop cards, really like great stuff. And it's something I just asked on an Instagram reel this week because I had a vintage card that was like a super low pop Tito 6 rare back. And I'll be honest, I asked the community, should I list it on eBay for a high price and or with a submit best offer? Should I consign it to an auction house? Should I save it and bring it to the national? 
And I had never really thought about Raymond listing it on Veriswap, but I like the notion of like, hey, I don't even know if I want to sell it, partly because I love it, partly because I don't know the price. And I'm kind of curious before we get into the one or two things that I wanted to kind of discuss, but I figured this is very relevant to what you guys are talking about today, Jeremy. How do you see a card like that kind of fitting into the ecosystem at Veriswap? Yeah, so um, actually the demand for vintage cards um, is actually a lot higher than we had initially anticipated. Uh, we initially anticipated like our customer base to, you know, just kind of be like, you know, the ultra modern uh, sneaker flipper, um, you know, type persona um, that focuses on high turnaround uh, versus like collectability. Um, but what we've seen uh, basically, we can like basically see what every user puts um, as their preferences. Um, and like, I was like actually very surprised when we saw that a lot of people actually wanted like vintage cards. Um, so I actually think a card like that uh, would basically do a lot better um, than uh, what I'd previously anticipated. And let me just, I, I like what you said there, Leighton, because I didn't even think of it that way. You did. And, and I think if I'm hearing you correctly, it's like if I have a card that I, I really like it and I want, I'd like to almost see what I could get for it, but I don't want to necessarily put a price on it. Maybe I don't want to put it out there and just take offers of, you know, kind of, and have to manage an inbox on say Instagram or Facebook, I can put it on Veriswap and just see if I, if anybody approaches me for it and what they're going to offer me uh, and have it contained to that platform, the Veriswap platform versus in and amongst your all, all your DMS on Instagram and that sort of thing. I, I think that's a pretty cool uh, ability for, of, of Veriswap. So I'm glad you pointed that out later. Or at least that's how I heard it, and that's how I could see. No, Jeremy, that's it. that's that's what I was suggesting. I think it would be a great use of it. And and let's be candid, right? Sometimes when we have a card, when we own it, meaning the owner, uh, we tend to see it through rose-colored glasses. So, like, you know, hey, I think it's so great, and maybe it is really great. But I've known I've been guilty of this. I've put too high of a price tag on something where literally I stymied any chance of a back and forth. And so I'm not looking to do that either, right? And so really what I like about it is, um, and I had a collector hit me up from Instagram. We just, we were kind of too far apart in the price. And it was interesting because we kind of went back and forth about like the auction house route. And Raymond, that's what sparked me to do a very brief reel showing this T206 home run Baker Lennox back which is really rare. It's pop two with PSA. And you know, there's a lot more than two collectors working on the set uh, with PSA or, or for that matter, SGC or any other grading companies. And so point being is like, yes, uh, Jeremy, you nailed it. Kind of, you put it out there and like, if no one bites or no one nibbles, no harm, no foul. Cause you actually have not put a price on it. Um, and I really liked that. And, and I was going to ask you, uh, Raymond, before I cover the, the couple things I want to talk about, do you think that would be an acceptable practice, if you will, and way to use your platform? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think um, what a lot of people um, don't realize is like it's always better to price your cards fairly slash low uh, because on our platform, there's no way you can buy the card now, right? So it's always better to receive an abundance of offers rather than zero offers um, on, on the card. Um, now that story might be different later uh, if we do plan to like introduce like a cash transaction option, right? Then you'd probably need to be little bit more wary of like how low you price your cards but right now there is actually not really um a harm to pricing cards low and, and you also aren't going like you know on instagram you post it to your story it's gone in 24 hours so you have to keep on posting it which is going to annoy some of your followers on on instagram so with veriswap it's just always there but that leads me to another question and and leighton i know you got a couple things to chat about but i want to ask this while it's on my mind is there any sort of integration or easy a couple clicks to share a Veriswap um, card on social media, like Instagram or Twitter. Very interesting that you mentioned that, Jeremy. Uh, we're actually in the process of working on something like that. Um, place where I have no idea. Share, uh, basically, uh, export their inventory um, to uh, their Instagram um, in a very clean, clear way. Um, we also plan on adding a share historical trades feature. Say, for example, like me and you, Jeremy, we um have executed a trade right we'll basically like create like a uh what is it? a template where people can vote on like you know jeremy won this trade raymond won this trade right uh so we're in the process of 
um, adding like more of sharing features to Instagram. Very cool. Very cool. All right, Leighton. Well, uh, welcome back again. And, uh, you know, always fun to get get both of my guests chatting together. Uh, so vintage update. What are you uh, what's on your mind this week? Sure. So first off, and I don't know how I, I neglected this last week because I think the salad already happened. Um, I wanted to make sure that we talked very briefly about the 1951 Bowman Mickey Mantle PSA 9 rookie card that sold for just over $3 million recently in memory lane. Very, very impressive sales, about four times uh, the last time the card sold uh, actually at memory lane uh, as well. Um, it's a pop nine. I believe there is a 10. I didn't check the pop on tens before I came on. Um, but this is, you know, I figured, Jeremy, we've already chatted for a few minutes, so I'll try to be brief and right to the point. So normally, when I see a sale like that, as both someone who has inventory, is a collector, is an investor, and also a buyer and seller of vintage cards, I feel like normally there's a a quicker or bigger or, or both um, trickle-down effect from, let's say, that nine price to the price of a five, a three, a two. And I'd have to say so far, at least, only um, because we've actually handled a number of 51 Bowman mantles in the last several weeks, um, I haven't really seen that happen yet. And in fact, even on the chatter side of things, in other words, those texts you'll get from a random customer, friend, dealer, you know, fellow, you know, partner, whatever the case is, um, I haven't really had anyone hit me up uh, looking for a 51 Bowman mantle. And in fact, I've still had more requests for a 52 Tops mantle in the last few weeks, even since that $3 million sale of a 51 Bowman mantle in the PSA 9. So I thought that was interesting to note and just bring that to the attention of, of your viewers, Jeremy. Um, it's only one little sample, right? You know, folks that I'm dealing with and, and the chatter I'm seeing. Um, I was curious if anyone else out there either has noticed the same thing, feels the same way, or for that matter, is really pissed off that I'm kind of outing the sale. And even though, of course, I'm joking because it's $3 million, it doesn't need to be outed. Point being is, is that, hey, they've had their eye on some mantles. They feel like they should be coming up on 51 Bowmans. And I feel like for me, ever since the Philly show, when someone asked me very um, point blank, hey, if I have $80,000, they use the number 80,000, I didn't make it up. Um, and I was going to buy either a 51 Bowman mantle and a little bit better of a grade and or centered or a lower grade 52 tops mantle, which would you advise Leighton that I would buy? And so a few weeks back at the Philly show, I was a little bit more torn and we had talked about it even on here, Jeremy, but I think even with now that sale of the memory lane 51 Bowman mantle, which is amazing, I'm, I'm more convinced than ever that if I was not contacted in the last few weeks for 51 Bowman mantles, and I don't really hear any chatter, let's say more than usual, but yet people are still going after the 52 tops mantle, both publicly and privately. To me, I would advise someone if they had $80,000 and they were only choosing between A and B, A being a 51 Bowman mantle, B being a 52 tops mantle, same amount of budget, just obviously with the 52 tops mantle, you'll get a lower quality card, i.e. grade. Um, I was curious if anyone out there who's listening and watching today or in the future, drop it in the comments, um, feels the same as me, or for that matter, they've seen an uptick and it's just my neck of the woods that hasn't. Yeah, it's an interesting comment, observation, experience. I mean, you know, as an owner of the 51 Bowman, I don't like what I'm hearing because I would I would hope that a $3 million sale in a high end in an upper level grade would trickle down a little bit to the lower grades, um, but that it doesn't. Well, what I still love the card, of course. I wonder if a bit of it just has to do with we're in December, we're coming up on holidays. You know, we covered uh, on Thursday night the PWCC premier auction, 282 lots, and there were a lot of cards that sold for a lot lower than what many people would have been hoping for people that either hold those same cards or the consigners or pwcc themselves and so i wonder if december is just slower than usual or if it's just that the only people that care about 51 bowman and mickey mantles are those that can afford the highest grade uh, i don't think that's the case completely but um interesting interesting to note and i think you know give it a few months and let's see uh, where things go from there yeah, well, it's always fun to nerd out and chat about the hypotheticals, even if you can't prove it. Yeah, um, for sure. So uh, very briefly, I wanted to show folks. So this is my work for tomorrow. I had to bring home a very small collection of vintage cards from the office. The card saver ones tend to be like the better cards. Nothing amazing, 
But, you know, we love, like, regular run-of-the-mill 1950s collections with anything from Mantle, Maze, Kofax, Clemente. There's about three or 400 cards in the collection. And typically, the way that we'll evaluate them is any card that we feel is going to be, you know, a certain dollar value and up. Uh, and obviously, it depends on the collection. You know, we're going to do a line item for that. And we're going to share with the person that owns the cards what we think the grade is and the value. And then, you know, we'd make an offer accordingly. Um, so that was kind of a fun little, uh, you know, thing to mention. Um, also, as a side note, talking about the 52 Tops Mantle. So Thursday, I'm uh, out of the office. I'm actually still in the vicinity of my um, place in Milburn, New Jersey. And I get a call, and it's very ominous from uh, John, J5, as he's known as uh, in my office. And he's like, are you near the office? Can you come back? I'm like, is everything all right? And he wouldn't say. And so at the end of the conversation, he's like, yeah, so I have someone in here with a 52 tops mantle. I'm like, is it real? He's like, yeah, I think it's real. I'm like, well, next time, just, you know, like between you and I, like lead off with that, <laughs> you know? And so he's like, no, no, I wanted to slow roll you. So anyway, um, uh, we looked at the collection. I looked at it, I ran back to the office, totally authentic. Uh, it would grade a one, um, 52 tops, Mickey Mantle, uh, 52 tops, Jackie Robinson, I would say a few other dozen, a few dozen other cards from the fifties, but he's got a bunch of other cards behind that. And so we gave him the valuation made him an offer. Yeah. I didn't know if he was selling. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know if it was in a game show, you know, what was happening. So uh, he's like very calm, cool and collect. He's like, you know, I'm, I'm just gathering information. Uh, it was a little bit hard to find. I'm like, you know, no, no problem. I'm like, uh, so, you know, do you want to sell the rest of the cards? You know, kind of give me an idea of where you're at. And, I mean, he was very, like, close to the vest. He's like, oh, you know, I'm not sure. I'm going to talk to my brother. Totally understand. Um, you know, would you like to call him now <laughs> kind of thing? And so uh, all in all, where we ended up was, hey, you know, I'm going to think about it. No problem. Um, can I grab your uh, – because, like, you know, I had his name. I'm like, can I grab your number, your email? He's like, I'll get back in touch with you. I'm like, all right. I get how this is going to be. I made him laugh about it. Uh, I'm like, listen, you know, don't worry. We're not going to harass you. But I'm like, I did put – uh, like a tracking device so one of the cards so I'm like don't <laughs> worry I'll know if you, and he laughed just like you did we had a great time so like who knows if we're gonna buy them so my point is like hey guys gang you know everyone's always showing off like when they buy a successful collection no one's ever showing like forget about the hard work like the hard the heartache the nervousness the anxiety so right now there's a 52 tops mantle that I know is on the streets of New Jersey and I want it yeah. and he won't even give me his phone number thank you for laughing Raymond um, boy, you got to have some fun with it. Even if you do this for a living, try to enjoy it. It's a great hobby. Um, and the last thing I want to close with today, and this is more because I'd love to see what your audience has to say, and I'll, I'll hop on and tune in in just a few. But I've been thinking a lot about this, and then someone put a post on one of these message boards. I think it was an F54. Um, it was like read my mind what I was thinking. So for each major sport, and the major sport being baseball, basketball, football, hockey, what card do you think – in each of those respective sports, before 1986 and earlier, I'm only choosing 86 because of Michael. You know what I mean? If I was going to go beyond that, I would have chose 2003 and just said LeBron, Brady, the whole thing. And if you want, I guess we could change it. But I'm curious what, what you know, in the general consensus is what folks believe will be the best performing card um, and most valuable. So in other words, if a card goes from a dollar to a thousand, we all know that percentage is, is off the charts, Right. But you're still only making a thousand bucks. So of the biggies, what do you think would be, um, you know, the best? And so I'm just going to start with baseball and kind of leave it to your gang, Jeremy, to discuss. But for baseball, I've narrowed it down to either the 1952 Topps Mickey Mantle, the T206 uh, Honus Wagner, or the 1914 um, Baltimore News Babe Ruth. Um, Cards so. that everyone can go buy. <laughs> well, well. to be fair, a 52 tops mantle, you could probably buy in lower grade. You know, it's it's obtainable. Wagner, you'd have to have a share of. Ruth, you'd have to even know where a card is. They're like impossible to find. Yeah. But it's still fun to discuss um, nonetheless, even if you can't own them. Yeah, no, it's a fun question. We had a couple of comments that sort of came in. So I'm going to read this before, before you hop off, uh, Leighton. So uh, Chris C made a comment about when we were talking about Veriswap vintage, I would trade for if I had the chance, but no one will trade modern for vintage. And I understand why scarcity wins. And there does seem to be a movement towards vintage kind of 
a trend, I would say, throughout the hobby right now. Ian Undercover said 52 is the choice because it's beyond iconic. And I think that's an important uh, word to add there is beyond. It is actually beyond iconic, that card. Chris C says it's more scarce, I would think, but market makes no sense oftentimes. Goes on to say, I will go, uh, he says 52 will be the go-to mantle forever, in my opinion. Nick Martelli, welcome to the show. Uh, with respect, uh, Leighton, to you having to wait to find out if you can buy that mantle. Justin Vick says the waiting is agony, and yes, it is. Larry's Classic says 52 Mays, the greatest living player. And Chris C says those aren't regular rollers cards, to quote Chris Tool. <laughs> exactly. Those are not regular rollers. Those are the high rollers. Leighton, thanks, uh, as always, for joining. Interesting stuff yet again. We'll see you next week. Actually, Absolutely. we won't. We'll, we'll be in touch. We'll see you soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having Thank me, gentlemen. It was great seeing you, Raymond. Take care. Good stuff. Good stuff with Leighton. Thanks uh, Thanks to Leighton for joining in. So let's get back to Veriswap, Raymond. We were talking about, uh, before Leighton jumped on, we were talking about how you did your pivot. Uh, the new platform is up and running. And um, I guess, why don't you just talk to us a little bit about, like, because I think a lot of people are going to wonder, sure, I can go to Veriswap, but what's going to happen? What is the actual process? How much work is involved in that kind of thing? Do you want to, and I did mention before that you did provide me with a link to a video which shows people the process. And I, I don't have that in the description for this episode right now, but I will add it afterwards so people can go watch that. And I recommend it because it's a very uh, thorough uh, uh, process that, it t- that you take them through. But do you want to, is there anything about the process that you would like to uh, to take us through now? Yeah, sure. So I can just walk you through it um, verbally. Sure. So you sign up to, to the Veriswap website, takes 15 seconds. Uh, you enter your phone number, you sign up with your Facebook account, very easy. You upload cards. Um, one of my favorite features on the website is like you can upload cards just via the PSA serial number. So for example, for this card, you just enter in the serial number. Um, and if PSA has scans, um, it'll pull the scan from the website um, and pull in all the classification information uh, on the top. So it literally takes five seconds to list a PSA card with a scan. Um, upload those cards onto our, your website, our website, price them. Um, and the next step is to basically browse through other people's inventory. So in the same way, like my slabs, uh, you know, you would scroll down the page, look at people's trade values um, and card values um, and propose a trade. Uh, we also have a feature called express interest, which basically is, um, you know, you're showing interest in uh, someone's cards without explicitly uh, offering a trade on your side. And then it's up to the other person to send an offer back. But anyways, um, in similar like, fashion, you, know, you can, yeah. I, I just want to say, I really like that express interest feature. That That's, that's pretty cool. That's well thought out from what I'm understanding. Sorry, please continue. Yeah, so from that point on, um, it's similar to what you would uh, do um, on Instagram. Uh, you know, you would send iterations of the trade offer back and forth. You can also add cash. Um, cash, we process using a service called Stripe, uh, which in our experience is much faster than PayPal, has lower fees than PayPal. Um, so for everyone who's who's used it, um, has loved it so far. Um, you can also send notes uh, within every iteration of an offer. So, you know, it can be like, Jeremy, like, I think your 52 cost mantle um, is nice, but I think it's overpriced, right? And then you can come back and be like, uh, you know, with some other comments um, to eventually like agree to a deal. Once uh, both sides agree to a deal, they pay the Veriswap fee. They ship the cards to Veriswap. Um, We're adding label creation. So soon you'll be able to press a button and then create a label instantly. Um, Ship it to our headquarters. We'll inspect it. Uh, we will then, once we receive both ends, we'll ship the cards out to each party. So right now you are in Sydney, Australia. Do you have sort of North American representation to handle those or, or do cards need to be shipped to Australia? Uh, they're shipped to California. Okay. So you have an office there. You have a partner. What What's in California? Uh, we have a partner in California and we're working with um, a few other hubs on the East Coast uh, to see if we can potentially speed up fulfillment times. Oh, that perfect. Perfect. Okay. Very cool. Uh, 
speaking of, you know, a, a partner in California, I want to, I always like to, with, with all new startups or, you know, I don't know if I can still call you a startup. I think I can, but with startups in the hobby, I like to always hear the founder speak about their team and kind of just let us know about the team and uh, yeah, how big is it? That sort of thing. Um, how happy are you with your team? That th- th- those type. Obviously, you're not going to say anything bad. They might be watching, but speak about your team if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, so seven people, including me. Um, I'm friends with my co-founder from high school. Um, he is the CTO of the company, so he's involved um, on the tech side, um, building kind of the technology infrastructure uh, behind basically the backbone um, of our website and of our app. Uh, we also have a designer. Um, she, her name is Tiffany. She's great. She is basically responsible for, you know, the sleek, uh, the sleek um, appearance of our website and the user user friendliness, uh, both on the website as well as the app side. Um, and then we also ha- work with um, a few developers. Um, so they help basically develop the app um, and the, uh, the website independently. So what about lenders. what about like social media? Because one of the things that I like that you're doing, I think it's really creative is, you know, and I follow Veriswap on Instagram, seems like every day a couple times uh, that account is posting one of those like who won the trade kind of posts and you show all the cards that went in each direction if there was money involved. And, you know, I respond to them when I know the cards. Oftentimes I don't, I don't keep up with modern football really. So I don't know who a lot of these, players are or who's winning the trade so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna provide an opinion because it just i I have nothing to base it on but all that said i think that's a lot of fun what has been the response to those posts and uh and is that is that uh your creative director who's doing that for you i'm making them uh (laughs) so i i I come up with uh so there's two types of posts there's the hypotheticals which are like hypothetical like what do you have um you know a or b there's also actual transactions right Actual transactions, um, our operations graphics designer helps create those, right? Those are actual transactions on the Verisol website. Uh, there's also hypotheticals of like, would you rather have A or B? Uh, I like to come up with like interesting scenarios in my head. So like one that one example that we had um, a few months ago was like uh, side A was like a Patrick Mahomes, I think it was a gold prism or something. Um, and, then, and then the right side was a... Uh, Massachusetts home. So it was like, M- it was a ma home. Um, so like, you know, we either have this home in Massachusetts or, you know, this gold uh, Patrick Mahomes uh, card. So there, there's like room, room for creativity for that. Um, and, but like at this point, we've gotten enough like actual transactions where, you know, that's enough organic content that people come to. Cool. What's your long-term vision for Veriswap? It's a good question. Um, so our medium-term focus um, is to become the one-stop trading shop for sports cards. Um, eventually, we want to move into other collectible categories. A um, couple that come to mind are uh, comics, watches, streetwear, coins, uh, anything of that sort with a strong secondary market. Cool. So let's let's sort of switch focus a bit. I think we've learned a lot about Veriswap. And again, I'll put a link to the to the uh, the tutorial and also, you know, check, you can check out Veriswap at veriswap.com, I'm guessing is the website. Yes. Yeah. And of course, follow Raymond and Veriswap on Instagram. You can see that on the ticker right now. But, you know, you had a finance job, you're, you're overworked, you started to hate it, you left it, you've now gone out on your own, starting a company in the hobby, the hobby's going through tumultuous times let's say up and down right what is how is this how has the experience been for you so far to start up a company in in the hobby and now to kind of change your experience with your hobby to be hobby and business how's that how has it been since you got involved with Veriswap? it's been great to be honest um i think like just philosophically the reason why i decided to focus on Veriswap. Um, instead of, you know, actually trading the cards, uh, was because I felt like, um, I, um, had already mastered, you know, the actual card trading, um, and that, you know, there wasn't a whole lot left to learn. Well, maybe there was, but like, I, I wasn't learning that much every single day. Um, but 
I did want, but there was like kind of a related area where it's like, okay, I know nothing about like creating app, creating website, uh, working with developers. Um, and it feels uncomfortable to me, um, but I can learn a lot um, in the process. So, you know, every single day, you know, I learn something new about creating a website, creating an app, how to launch a website, how to launch an app, right? Like the strategy behind it. Um, so I like, like basically my impetus was like, you know, whatever will uh, like teach me the most things um, and uh, will make me like, you know, a wiser person at the end of the day. Have you, have you made any deals yourself on the, on the platform, found any cards that you were really excited to, to find? Yes. Um, I myself have done, I think about 15 transactions on the website. Um, yeah. Um, the other day I got, what did I get? I've gotten like a Mahomes auto. Um, I got a Giannis prism BGS 10. Um, yeah, there were, there are a few like nice cards that I've picked up, um, throughout the, throughout the last few months, uh, on the platform. Right. On. And it's also cool because like, you know, I can like be, I'm basically like the, the, the tester of the platform, right. I can like, I don't have to ask other people how oh, I do, but like, um, you know, I can basically like guide the direction of the product based on my own experience. Right. I'm like, Oh, like this button, the order of these buttons is like not intuitive or like, um, Oh, like, you know, there's this problem that's causing trades not to happen. Right. Um, that would have been a lot more difficult had I not been like an actual user of the product. For sure. Um, how have you funded this thing from the beginning? I mean, is, are you self-funded? Did you have, do you have investors? Um, do you have plans to raise money in the future? As of right now, it's all self-funded. Uh, but we're in the process of raising a seed round. And do you have plans on what you would do with that money once you raise it? Yeah. So, um, a couple ways, uh, first is a few key hires. So, uh, we want someone with expertise in marketing right now. What we do is like, uh, it's pretty bare bones. Uh, so we want to basically like get the name of Verisoft out there. Right. Um, second is on the technical product side, right? I think, although we have like a pretty big team, we can always move faster and create a uh, product and test it, test it faster. Um, and then third would be, uh, logistics centers, right? Like right now we have a hub in California, uh, but we can always do better by having hubs across um, the country to make our experience uh, faster uh, for people who use our platform. Right on. Well, sounds like you got a plan and uh, I wish you well with it. You know, establishing trust in the hobby is something that is really important uh, across the board. You know, if you have a, well, even if you're, even if you're a seller at a card show and people want to deal with you, a lot of people want to, you know, it's always good to have a good reputation in this, in this hobby. So let's just talk a bit about establishing trust because the hobby that's going to, whoever's going to use Veriswap now has to trust Veriswap as well. You can't just trust that, you know, you, you, you may not trust the person you're trading with. So you're going to use a service like Veriswap. Why should the hobby trust Veriswap? What, what, uh, what can you point to or what, what do you, how do you sort of answer that question when you get asked it? Yeah, uh, that's a, that's a very valid, that's a very good question. Um, I think personally, like if I were somebody who had never used Veriswap before, um, the reason why I would trust Veriswap was because I've been in the hobby for a good while and I've been involved in the space. I know how the space works. Right. And, you know, before starting Veriswap, you know, I was a card trader myself. I kind of know the pain points, um, all the large, you know, card traders. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm physically at the shows. I, I know the people who are, you know, on the show floor, right. It's not, um, you know, it's, I'm not someone who like joined the hobby yesterday. Um, and I think, I think second is just like a matter of time. Right. I think, um, personally, like I would also be skeptical of like, you know, if a company popped out of nowhere and, um, you know, started like fulfilling transactions. Um, but I think like that skepticism naturally, naturally goes away, um, as more and more people, um, use the platform, um. We're also partnering with, um, you know, large, a couple of the larger players in the space, uh, such as uh, PSA, um, to to basically um, allow for a smoother flow of uh, cards into their vault. Um, so hopefully, like those partnerships uh, will strengthen um, our reputation as well. And I think also the fact that you, as the founder of Veriswap, is also the administrator for some very large Facebook groups. You're a known person. You aren't just somebody that popped out out of nowhere. 
and started a uh, you know this this uh, service. So that like if I were if I were if someone were to say to me why should I trust Veriswap and Raymond Raymond Lee's company? I would say, well, I, I met him. I had him on the show. Judge for yourself. First of all, do you like the guy? But second of all, you could probably talk to some people in these groups that he administers and see what they think of him. They've known him for a, a bit of a while. Like, like you, you can't mess up. You can't do something uh, and not have your name kind of, you know, called out because you are you are a public figure in the hobby based on or for the fact that you're on uh, these Facebook groups. Is, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, um, I think at the end of the day, right, like uh, my reputation, the company's reputation, the reputation of my Facebook groups is like the number one most important thing, right? So personally, like I'm going to do everything I can to protect that um, and I'm not going to take any risks um, in terms of like tarnishing that reputation. Cool. Okay, so as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the hobby is, uh, it's, it's been going through the times. It's been going through the times over the last couple of years. And I really think that anyone who has been in from, you know, if, if you were in the hobby 2018, 19 and, and before, and you're still in it today here in December, 2022, you've learned a lot about the hobby. If you're paying attention, you've learned a lot about how the hobby can move and how trends can change and things can get hot and not. And people kind of move together through different sorts of uh, niches within the hobby and that. So I want to get your take on the hobby and, you know, what, what did you sort of learn in 2022 uh, about the hobby? And then what do you expect in 2023? But let's start with 2022. What, what's your, what's your take? Here we are again, we're at the end of the year. We're in the middle of December already. Can't believe it. What are some of your takeaways from 2022? I think this is like a piece of like trite advice that you hear from like a lot of people in the hobby, but buy what you like. I think that um, if you buy what you like and you get value and happiness from owning things that you like, price is almost like a second consideration, right? Like in a world where like these cards go to zero, but you still love these cards, like it's still beneficial to own them, right? Um, that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is just to, you know, not not buy off of hype, right? I think like, um, I think people are slowly starting to learn this in 2020, you know, tail end of 2021. Um, but, you know, back in 20, you know, middle of 2020, like prices were going crazy, right? People were buying completely off of hype. Um, and so I, I think it's important to kind of like keep that balanced perspective in mind. Yeah, I think, I, th I think you're right. I mean, those are two, like you said, kind of obvious, uh, types of things and the first one which is collect what you like or buy what you like you know it i think if we're saying it now i wonder if some people are kind of going to respond to people saying that is like well you have to say that because you want to you you, you kind of want to talk yourself into not being mad at yourself for not selling earlier or something like that but i don't know that that's really the case you know i'm just kind of doing devil devil's advocate there but really it's always been that way for me. Buy what you like. And if you like it, and it happens to be something that is valuable and can turn into an investment, then eh, that's pretty cool too. Maybe the money you spend will be worth more down the road. And if it's worth less down the road, well, you're still building a collection. And it just depends what how long that road is for you. I say it all the time, but you know, my road isn't next week, next month, or even next year. It's well down the road. So I, you know, what what happens month to month, year to year doesn't really bother me. I'm human. So it's like, sure, I could have sold my collection a year ago and then bought it back today and had some extra money in the bank. But I don't really think that way. So um, so to me, as you said, buy what you like, collect what you like. While we really, it, I think it really got, it really got hammered home for us in 2022. And for people who were sitting on cards that went up in value and then came back down, you, you know, that's just something to remind yourself. It's not like it, it, it is collect what you like, but it's also I collect what I like. Like, you yeah. know what? It's like, yeah, that's what I'm doing. So don't worry about the the day to day, week to week, month to month, even year to year. Just enjoy your collection. And now if you're in it to flip, if this is how you're paying your bills, 
then your approach might and your response might be a little bit different. And then it's like even collect what you like doesn't apply because I'm not a collector. Somebody might say they might say, no, I'm not a collector. I'm a I'm a flipper. I'm an investor. I'm a dealer. Dealer is kind of the more polite way of saying flipper, I think. Right. It seems like so. So let's add, let me reframe the question a little bit. Not to put you on the on the spot here, or, and I know I didn't kind of prep you with this, but what what do you think the take like if you were a flipper or a dealer who was really just in this to make money, what's the best advice you and me could give those people moving out of 2022 and into 2023 who still want to do this as a business? It's a interesting question. I think. So this is actually like kind of coming from like a chat I had with my friend this morning. Um, I think the move is to uh, move into more blue chip items. Um, I was talking with my friend and he mainly deals with like vintage. And I was like, oh, like, are you wor worried about like the market like softening a little bit in the past few months? I'm like, oh, I haven't really touched it too much. Um, but, you know, my collection is still worth 95% of what it used to be worth uh, because all I do is vintage, right? Um, so I think like, you know, maybe like even moving like earlier and earlier, you know, maybe like even pre-1986, right? Like I wouldn't even know if you count that as vintage, but you know, just like, you know, like vintage baseball, right? Like that those those items are like very, very stable, right? So I think it's still, you know, if you're like purely a flipper, there's like still um, ways to make money. I think you just, I, I think that like the pool of available items where you can do that is just like a lot, a lot smaller now. I th yeah, I, th I think that I think what you just said is exactly right. You can't do it on every prism basketball rookie card anymore. You have to be a little bit smarter, a little bit more savvy and and, uh, you know, focus. I think also we have, you know, the hobby has lost some of these flippers slash dealers. Yeah. So there's more room now for the survivors. And I think those who survive 2021, 2022 are going to be poised well moving forward into the future to be you know, real, well, maybe well-known, successful, uh, long-term hobby dealers. And the hobby's always had these people. So, you know, we just might have a bit of a changing of the guard and that might be coming. So, I, well, it's always happening, but let's go to a few comments because we have some good ones that have come through. I'm just going to start at the Let's top. Yeah. And uh, first, we'll say hello to John Wee, who's the founder, well, co-founder of Center Stage. Say hi to John. I know you guys are buddies. Hello, hello. Good to, <laughs> I like the snazzy suit photo. In the, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good avatar there, yeah, John. Very professional. Uh, Justin Vick says, I collect Will Greer cards. He grew up where I live. That's a great reason to collect somebody. Uh, really good reason. Christy yeah. says uh, to, to you, Raymond, any chance of trading sealed wax in the future on the Veriswap app? It's not just cards that go up. We've actually gotten this across multiple times. Uh, so we do plan on adding uh, wax as a tradable asset probably in the next two months. Very good. Alexander, welcome back, says, enjoying the show. Any stats about the number of successful transactions on Veriswap? I've heard some users don't like the ease of backing out of deals. Considering joining myself, haven't used it yet. Yeah, so we currently have done about $1.1 $1 .1 million in transactions across about 100 successful trades. Uh, the point about the ease of backing out deals is actually really interesting because we are releasing a feature um, next week um, that will make it very hard, if not impossible, to back out of deals. So um, basically, we have the ability to store credit card information now, and we will um, apply a penalty for people who uh, do not, uh, you know, ship out a deal once um, once it is agreed to. Well, that. I mean, that's good timing on Alexander asking the question that you have something to kind of solve for that coming up in a week. And um, good on you for being proactive with that. I hope that uh, that sort of satisfied you there, Alexander. Uh, Nick Martelli said, I think the people who buy what you like really aren't too hard pressed about prices being down. I agree. I think it comes down to the collector or buyer. We had such a flood of flippers in the market. Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying, Nick Martelli. And I think we kind of talked about it. So We'll keep on going. And thank you, Nick, for asking people to hit the like button. Please go ahead and hit that like button. Chris C says, we had too many speculators, in my opinion. Yeah. And they were speculating on players that are of a speculative nature, like first, second, third year players, prospects. So, I mean, it's the gamble. It's 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 that whole thing. And um, 
yeah, it, I think I think that uh, those people might not. A lot of them, you know, some will stick around, some of them won't. And uh, but the ones that do can be, if they pivot, their strategy can be successful moving forward. Speaking of successful, Alexander says successful flipping will begin to equate to short term high quality investing. If you buy desirable blue chip items, you'll be more able to flip them because they are desired by investors and collectors. Makes sense to me. What do you think yeah. of that, Raymond? Makes sense, right? Yeah, I, I think my only thing is begs the question of what blue chip is, right? Like I feel like um, in the down market, like the definition of blue chip um, is getting more and more narrow. Um, so it depends on what you describe as a blue chip. But I think like things, like I said earlier, like, you know, like very rare, very rare vintage baseball. Um, I think like those would still qualify under that definition. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, blue. That's an that's an interesting topic right there. Is like, what is what is the the comprehensive definition of blue chip items in the sports card hobby? And I think you're definitely going to go. You're in there. You're definitely have vintage Hall of Fame cards, whether it's rookie cards or other important subsequent year cards. And there's several of those. And then you're going to have more of the modern day. And by modern, I'm talking about players who are still playing or retired recently you know you can still have blue chip players who are still active not yet in the hall of fame guys like lebron james guys like Sidney crosby to me those guys are blue chip but players who are not blue chip are players who just haven't proven themselves yet and that's what that's what prospecting is for i think people are always going to prospect people were prospecting well before 2020 and i mean Raymond, here's a kind of a funny story. Back in 91 to 94, I had a card, I had a card shop in Winnipeg, Canada. And I remember I had this older gentleman used to come in and he wanted to fill out a nine pocket binder page filled with one with every player. So what I mean is like nine cards of each player. Like, and I'm talking like if anyone here knows hockey, Brian Fogarty, Ken Hodge Jr. I mean, players that didn't really turn into anything, but he was prospecting in the early 90s on these things. You could go on on eBay or anywhere else, really, and like looking at the back of Tough Stuff magazine, Beckett magazine, and you could find ads for lots of 100 rookie cards, if not more, of Todd Van Poppel and Eric Karros and Scott Erickson and, uh, you know, from the from 91 baseball among others. So um, people have always been prospecting. It's just, is the prospecting, are you paying a dollar a card or are you paying a thousand or 10,000 a card? You know, like, is Giannis a prospect? No, I think Giannis is, is a blue chip player right now. But if you're still active, you can do something that can ruin you to the hobby. Like, yeah. Tatis, you know, like steroids or that kind of thing. So lots of moving parts, but it's a fun conversation. Uh, I've said a lot there, Raymond, anything you want to, you want to speak to? Yeah. I think like, I was like watching some like YouTube videos back from like 2020 or like 2021 where people were like, Oh, like, you know, like LeBron limited logos, Le LeBron exquisite. Uh, like those are like, you know, blue, blue chip cards. Um, I'm not sure if I would agree anymore, actually. Like, I feel like, um, like, like I, I think time in the market, um, I, I think like whether or not something is blue chip um, is mainly dictated based on like, I guess, market conditions um, rather than like the actual like legacy, legacy of the player. Uh, like the player itself might be blue chip, uh, but I don't think the player is card. Like I, th I think a player can be blue chip, but uh, the card of that player could be possibly not blue chip. Right. Some of the cards can be, some would not be. Like you're talking about, LeBron 2003 exquisite. I sort of think now even blue chips can go down in value with an economy. Yeah. It happens in the stock market. It's going to happen in the sports card market. So is a LeBron James limited logos, for example, so not his rookie card, but a rookie year insert. To me, it's as good as a rookie card, really. Um, but is that a blue chip card? I mean, I think it is, but it's still probably come down in value over the last year, but it went up too high in the first place. So you know, you're probably safer buying that than, you know, a LeBron James 2022 prism, whatever. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I think I, I hear what you're saying and I agree to it for the most part. Uh, okay. Yeah. Go ahead, please. Oh, no, sorry. Continue. Uh, I was going to go. I was going to change the topic. Go to some yeah. more comments. Chris C says, I focused on goats 
sealed wax and my PC guys. Hey, that's a that's a good approach because goats are often blue chip. Yep. Uh, Nick Martelli says, I think to Alex's point, the low end flip is dead and it will be more high end or vintage. Yes, except for you can buy collections from people who are selling, you know, cards worth five dollars each for 20 cents on the dollar. Like that's what because it's so much work to move those cards yep. and then sell those cards. Now, you may not flip them. They're not worthy of, of, a, of, of the real estate at a, at a card show in your showcase because it's just not worth it. But you can still sell them other ways as dollar boxes and that kind of thing and make money that way. But that's a lot of work and it's a lot, it's a lot of weight and all that. What do you think of that, Raymond? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, like, if you think about, like, um, I, I think, yeah, like, there is a value to time, right? Um, like, the time it takes to, like, take a photo of card, list it, categorize it. In the case where you're not at a show, like, ship it out, right? Like that adds friction, adds friction as well. Um, I, I think like if you find enjoyment to that process, like, like by all means, like do it. Um, but, but I think like, yeah, it is possible to like make money in the lowest of low ends. It just takes a lot of, a lot of effort. Right. I, I think someone should actually do an experiment on that. Like to see like, you know, if like, you know, if you flip these like really like low end cards with like high percentage returns, like how much money could you actually make? Right. I, I would, I think like it would actually be pretty surprising. I think you'd make like a decent amount. It's just like a ton of effort. Well, that's, you're so right. Time is money. And that's why, you know, and so is, so is real estate at a card show. If that's how you're going about your, your business, if, you know, uh, time to just post cards on Instagram. I mean, do you want to bother posting $2 cards on there or do you, you know, cause now you got to talk to people. It's your, yeah. your DMs. are So there is a way to make money, uh, by flipping low end cards, but it's maybe not as, easy and, and convenient as, you know, more valuable cards. Uh, Joe Pearl, welcome to the show, says, howdy, everyone. How's the vibe on Josh Giddy down under? Can you speak to that, Raymond? I think I've seen, um, I've seen him on some, like, McDonald's ad or something. Uh, I've seen his face in some, in some places. Good. Okay. Chris C says, blue chip means proven either current or future Hall of Fame players to me. Yeah, me too. All, current Hall of Fame or like, sorry, already in the Hall of Fame or going to be in the Hall of Fame makes sense to me. Like that's your LeBron James, your Sidney Crosby or Mike Trout. Yeah. Like they're still blue chip players. Yeah. Perk says, I think it prevents dealing from feeling like too much of a job if you're fueling a collection of what you like versus just trying to make money. I got to read this again. I think it prevents dealing from feeling like too much of a job if you're fueling to co the collection of what you like versus just trying to make money. Yeah, can prevent it from feeling like that's right. I mean, if you're doing both at the same time, dealing becomes just a way to a way to subsidize or finance your personal collection. That's why I started setting up a card shows in the first place because hey, if I can move a card I don't like anymore, a card I pulled that I don't want and use that money to buy a single I do want, that's a that's a great uh Great process from as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Chris C says, uh, guys like Tim Duncan are so undervalued to me, but I still buy him because he was great to me. And that's that's a great example of a player who was great. He's a Hall of Famer. Is he blue chip? Well, his value shouldn't really go down to um, outside of regular market cycles. But yeah, I, that makes sense to me. Chris says, I appreciate the ones who don't get their due also it makes sense. Gem Mint in the house. Make sure you're following Gem Mint on Instagram. Yo, yo to you. And Vintage Card Collector says, I don't use it much yet, but I think Com C is the most efficient way to move low end, much less work and friction. And yeah, I mean, I I, I like using Com C for that, you know, 5 to $50 card, or even 2 to $50 card is a great place there. Is Com C, sorry, do you consider Com C to be competition for what you're doing? Or, or, I mean, they've been around so long, they're pretty established. Do you consider yourself to be competition towards Com C? Not really. I think we focus in like two very different spaces. Like I think Com C is mainly like raw cards. We actually only allow graded cards. Um, and then we focus on much more high end of the market. So like our average trade is in like a couple of thousands of dollars. And you said you only allow graded cards on the platform. So are you limited to certain grading companies or any grading company? How does that work? Yeah. So right now we only allow PSA, BGS and SGC. And so, as you know, I'm with, I work with tag grading now. What would the process be for a company like Tag or another 
another grading company to be able to have cards admitted onto the Veriswap platform? Yeah, I think it comes down to uh, what the users want, right? Like if users um, have very strong opinions on whether or not they want to include one grading company or another, um, and we hear that feedback consistently, um, then we will consider adding it. Basically, like all of our new features, uh, all of the product direction of our product, um, it comes from uh, what our users message, message us every single day. Um, so for those guys listening, if you guys use Veriswap and like have any uh, sort of feedback, um, extremely helpful to us, helps us guide like where we want to take the direction of the product. But let's say somebody said to you, we want we want to use a grading company that doesn't have a good reputation or something like that. Would you let the, would you admit those cards anyway? Uh, depends on how many people ask that. Okay. Right? Like I think ultimately uh, numbers speak. Uh, we'll do what our customers. I guess if your customers want, a lot of them want a, a cards of a specific grading company, that grading company is likely not going to have a bad reputation if people are, are wanting it. So that makes yeah, sense. They kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. So they kind of do. Yeah. Nick Martelli wants to know, are they going to keep track of any pop reports or even population changes due to slab cracking? I don't, I don't know who that question's for, Nick. Who's they? I guess for the grading companies, right? I don't think it's a very swap. No, question. I don't think it's a very swap uh, either. Um, I know that as far as like, you know, PSA and BGS go, if you were to crack a card out of their slab, the only way that they will adjust their population report, I think, I think is if you send them that little, you know, is if you actually send them the little flip and yeah. say, here, here's your original flip. Now, you know, that that's been cracked out. So I believe that's how, it, how it works, Nick, but um, there may be a couple other uh, instances where they will do that. Uh, he's asking for Veriswap, uh, but why would Veriswap have that? In, I don't understand why Veriswap would, would, do you understand Raymond, what he's asking? I'm not sure if I understand that question uh, because the cards on our platform, are all graded and we don't do any cracking. Or grading for that matter. So, or grading. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mitch Grotman wants to know, does Veriswap's process include authenticating the slabs that it receives, i.e. making sure they're not receiving and sending a fake PSA slab? Uh, that's a good question. So um, we will compare the slabs to, you know, other PSA slabs um, that we have. We'll make sure that, you know, the slab hasn't been cracked or like, you know, scratched uh, to the best of our ability. Um, however, we don't, you know, since we're not PSA, there's no way we can like legally authenticate and be like, okay, like that's an authentic PSA slab. Do your terms and conditions uh, alleviate you of any responsibility if, if there is like, or are you simply a middleman service? that is arranging these trades or, you know, be, because, you know, eBay just, uh, just this past year started offering their authentication service where, you know, they're authenticating cards. So I'm yeah. not, you know, you know, Veriswap is no eBay, that's for sure, at least not yet. But, you know, are you, um, yeah, how do you, how do you kind of respond to that? Yeah, uh, currently we don't offer authentication for slabs. Uh, we are working to partner with the grading companies to, authenticate down the road. Okay. So always looking to improve and get better as time goes on, which I'm a, I'm a fan of that. All right. So listen, um, I've got to the end of my notes for this show. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about Raymond uh, about you collecting purse? Oh, sorry. There's one other thing I want to mention. You have your own podcast. Actually, you had me on it a couple months ago. Now I had a great time with you. Um, talk a bit about your podcast and you know, What's the purpose of it? What do you try, what do you try to do on it? How can people find it? Yeah. Um, so the podcast is called the Verisalt Podcast. You can find it on YouTube or on Spotify. Um, I mean, I just like, I started this podcast because I like talking to people in the hobby. Like that's the only reason. Um, we are going to make Veriswap specific content um, on the podcast. So one content idea that we had was um, since we see all the trades that people do on our platform um we want to do some sort of like trade review video where uh people can like form opinions um on on transactions i think that would be that's one thing that i'm really excited about that we're going to be launching soon that's pretty cool but your your trade your uh your veriswap uh podcast to date is really conversational like you call it the veriswap podcast almost as if veriswap is sponsoring it but it's not really exactly it's really like our conversation had nothing to do with Veriswap. It was more or less get to know the guest type of content, right? 
Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but you know, in the future, there will be more bear swap focused content. So say for example, like, you know, someone like you, Jeremy, uh, you would be, uh, on the Veriswap podcast, talk about transactions that have occurred on the Veriswap platform. Or That's cool. That give, giving, cool giving your two cents. Yeah, I like that. Skeppy wants to know, what is your single biggest challenge as a collector? Actually, before this one, let's go to Terry Fortune's comment. He says, is trade safe still a thing? This sounds somewhat similar. Well, I'm qualified to speak to that because I was a part of trade safe uh, for about a year and a half or so. Um, I don't know, to be honest, I don't know if trade safe is still a thing. Um, I have not been a part of that group uh, going back to this past summer and have not been keeping up with them. So I've seen, I haven't seen anything about trade safe since then. I, I don't think there's much going on there, but I don't know for sure. Cause I'm just not following it, but um, it, you're right, Terry, this does sound familiar, uh, sorry, similar uh, I think I think one of the differences is that I think Raymond and Veriswap are just way sort of ahead of where TradeSafe um, ever got. And uh, I think that Veriswap is a much slicker uh, platform. I mean, you look at you look at his platform. I'm I'm kind of glad I'm not I'm not a part of TradeSafe anymore because I think Veriswap would have could have maybe uh, crushed it just as far as how far ahead they are. So um, not exactly sure. But uh, yeah, it's very similar, Terry. Uh, on to Skeppy's question. What is your single biggest challenge as a collector and as a business owner, Raymond? Yeah, um, I was actually talking about this with my friend the other day. Um, I think knowing how to divide my time. Um, I love doing both, but I have finite amount of time and resources. Um, so I think knowing how to split between my passion for collecting and my passion for uh, Veriswap um, has been probably the biggest challenge. That makes a lot of sense to me. That's I think that's always a challenge when you, you know when you're passionate about any hobby, any interest, really. But it's so easy for me, at least, to talk about it when it comes to sports cards because I've been passionate about it for so long. But when you're passionate about sports cards, and then you have a sports cards business as well, which I did in the early nineties with a shop. And I was, you know, it was always tough. Cards would come into the store, Raymond, that, you know, a, a collector would want to sell. And back then it was that those were the days of where that you went into a card shop. All you expected was 50% of the value or of, of the Beckett value. And all cards were really sold at Beckett value. That's all people would pay. They wouldn't pay any more. And uh, they were they didn't expect to pay any less. So you'd buy you get you'd, you'd buy your invent your walk in inventory at fifty percent of kind of book value back in those days. And um, I remember people coming in with cards, and I'd be like, "Oh gosh, I want this for myself. I don't want to put it into the store's inventory and sell that." That was a big challenge. And then I think so. You know, I was watching some content uh, earlier today. Uh, uh, the sports card therapist, which is uh, Rob Gerard, and he had his his women of the hobby round table. And one of the I think it was Sharon Black Jaded Wolf said that one of the best pieces of advice she ever received was that you if you're going to become a dealer, you can't also be a collector. Now, I can't get I can understand that, but I certainly could not operate that way because I'll always be a collector, too, even though I do set up as a dealer at shows. So that's a challenge, too, is separating your hobby from your business if they are the same thing you know time is one thing of course but you know how do you how do you not want to you know get high on your own supply as they say in other industries right like you kind of want to keep some stuff for yourself i know i know i do when i buy a collection raymond and i buy it to use as inventory at card shows i all the best part of it is going through and picking out some pieces for my own personal collection you know you buy it and then you go shopping from your own your own uh, inventory. I, I always enjoy doing that. So, do you ever have you ever had that kind of experience? Yeah, um, I, I used to buy. It's probably like in like 2019. I used to buy like whole collections on Facebook, and sometimes I wouldn't even know what was inside. Like there'd be like one or two random cards that I'd be like, "Oh, like this looks really cool. Um, I'll, I'll I'll keep it." Especially like those like 90s Jordan inserts. Like a lot of times, like um, you'll like they look a lot cooler in person than they do uh, through photos and like you'll, you'll, you'll kind of get it and be like oh I actually really want it I think I'll keep it and then you know you'll sell the rest of, I would sell the rest of the collection and then be like oh like you know I got this card for free and that that is a good feeling as well that that is that is fun you know 
when when you buy a collection and then you let's say you buy a collection for thousand dollars and you then sell that collection you know you piece it out either quickly or slowly maybe you sell for 12 or 1500 dollars but you've kept back three or four cards that are going to fit in your own collection yep like those are those are the those are some fun cards to have because you're you're you know you're in them for basically nothing very little to nothing but maybe you still love them and they're also they're also a memento of that collection like i don't buy a ton of collections i buy a few you know maybe if i'm lucky i can buy three or four collections a year maybe and so the cards i keep from those become memories of that year you know because maybe i buy one a season literally that's about all it is for me yeah. if that now it's going to take me back to you know fall of 2022 when i bought this collection i recently recently bought a collection of supreme patches and i kept like 20 of them for myself it's a lot of cards, but it was a it was a 950 card collection. So those 20 cards become my memory of that collection, doing the deal with my buddy Kurt, who I bought them from, selling some of them. Like that's all a lot of fun right there. So yeah, fun, fun stuff right there. Uh, Justin Vick says, hi on your own supply might be the light <laughs> of the night. Yeah, well, but I mean it's true, you know. You it, it's it takes discipline and almost a change of like outlook and maybe even lifestyle to go from a collector to purely a dealer because you have to not I don't want to say you have to but you're better probably going to be more successful if you just do if you're just not a collector anymore because you're collecting you're actually stopping yourself from selling making a margin reinvesting selling making a margin that whole snowball effect over time and your business might just be less successful than it otherwise would be which is okay for someone like me who's not in it for the buying selling i enjoy that but at the heart of it for me is collecting and just enjoying my cards i think the natural progression is like a lot of people they enter the hobby uh, for the purpose of making money um, they start flipping they start seeing all these cards um, and then after you like kind of get exposed to these cards and like the nuances of the cards and like the effort that it comes to designing them um, at least certain it's certainly been the case for me at like i slowly grew to like love the cards themselves um like it's kind of just like yeah you come for the money and you stay for the cards um and slowly like i've seen that so many times uh so many times through um i've talked with my friends i don't know if you've experienced this too but like like that's what people keeps people in the hobby like every time i talk to my friends they're like oh i'm leaving the hobby i think i'm done with cards i've never actually seen a person leave cards entirely um and i think part of it is because they eventually learn to love the cards even if the money is not there anymore I think, yeah, man, I'm glad to hear that. And I think I've always thought that was the case. And I've, I've, I know a few examples, people that have gone through that, that's been their path. Um, so it's nice to hear that that's been your perception because I've, I've been saying that for the last couple of years. Yeah, we're, we're, we have a lot more people that are coming to the hobby. They're not all going to stay here, but we're going to, we have, the hobby has grown. It's still, I believe the hobby, you know, just from a participant perspective, is there's more participants now than there were like pre-pandemic in very early 2020. So that's a net gain for the hobby in, as far as growing the hobby. And, you know, again, with fanatics coming on board and having so much at stake and having their marketing prowess and reach and, you know, just their, their ability to, to reach people, I think uh, we will, we will grow some more. So, yeah, we kind of went like this, we've come down here. We're going to eventually figure out where we land. And then maybe we have a slow trickle upwards over the next few years as Fanatics does its thing. And more and more people are introduced to the hobby and realize that, yeah, these cards are fun. They're they're nice and, and they're they're some are rare, some are scarce, some are rare and scarce. And they're 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 worth it to collect and enjoy. And then there's the community, which, you know, if you become involved in the community, it becomes the hobby does become a lifestyle, which is part of the words to the opening song of my show. So, yeah, fun hobby talk right there. I'm, I'm glad we uh, we got into that stuff because that, that, this is the you know it's always fun to learn about startups and people in the hobby trying to you know launch a business and 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 offer a service. But I really enjoy talking about uh, the hobby and how we're looking at things. How about you? Yeah, it's almost like kind of like the more time you spend, the more your sucked into it it's like kind of like a, yeah. a, a, a vortex and the harder it is to get out right like uh like yeah like to, to be honest like I, I don't really see myself doing anything else 
um, outside of the sports court space. Um, and I, I think like a function of that is just like, I've been doing it for a while and like the momentum gets stronger and stronger. Uh, like the, the more time I spend, right. It's not only like the community, like independent of the community, right. Independent of the community, independent of like all these like new changes such as fanatics entering. It's just like, I just like cards and like the cards themselves more and more um, as, as time goes on. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Like, you know, I grew up watching all the sports, you know, football was probably the one I watched the least, like growing up in the eighties and nineties, but I want, you know, hockey, baseball, basketball, especially in the second half of the eighties and then football. Yeah. Late eighties, early nineties, but and I love what, and I still love watching hockey and basketball a little bit, football a little bit, baseball. The Blue Jays have to be in or close to the World Series for me to watch it. But I do, I do like sports, but I like the cards better for whatever reason. Yeah. You know, I just I enjoy the the card hobby better than the sports fan hobby. But I still do enjoy sports too. So it's uh. <laughs> It's a, it's a fun hobby to have. There's no doubt about it. So listen, we're going to, we're going to wrap this up, Raymond. Um, is there anything else you'd like to mention before we we go any, and to the chat, any final comments or questions? And I'll remind you all, I am doing an after hours episode tonight. It's scheduled to start in about 33 minutes, probably going to start it early. So, you know, depending if we end, if we do end this now, I just saw Skeppy had another question. So we will, uh, I like he's taking his last question and and adding a, a layering on a new one. So, uh, but let me just finish quickly. So we'll be doing an after hour show tonight. I've got my top 22 pickups of 2022 that I'm excited to share with everybody. And um, so we'll start that shortly after different stream, same channel. So if you hang out the channel, you'll see that. Uh, Raymond, before we go back to you, let's go to Skeppy's question. When your biggest challenge is how you balance time between personal and dealing you know you chose the right business. Yes, because you like doing both. Did you catch that, Raymond? Basically, like, if that's your biggest problem, it's like, oh, first world problems. Like, I'm sorry that you can't decide between enjoying your collection or enjoying running your business. Yeah, I think, so for context, like I'm 27 years old. Um, I think the thing that'll benefit me in long term and like the thing that I enjoy the most is like learning. Um, so I think whatever... Um, option at the end of the day gives me uh, the best learning experience. Um, I, I think it's something that I'll, I'll least regret in the, in the long run. Yeah, right on. Okay, well, that's a nice way to end. So thank you, Raymond Lee of Veriswap for joining the show tonight. You can follow Raymond on Instagram at It's Raymond Lee and also at Veriswap. So check those out. I will put a link to the Veriswap tutorial in the in the youtube video description uh later today you can check that out raymond um yeah thanks for coming on and final words to you yeah thanks for having me jeremy and uh one last uh thing that i wanted to mention was that um uh, we are releasing the verisop app um in the google play store and the app store uh within the next few weeks uh so keep your eyes peeled um, in our newsletter um, that i'll be dropping soon you'll be able to trade on your phone through drag and drop. That's really cool. I'll, de I'll definitely uh, download the app. Thanks again, Raymond, for joining. Thank you to the chat. Come back and join us in, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. I'll be back for after hours. Looking forward to it. But for now, this episode is over. Thanks again, Raymond.